work in us. And the scripture reading is Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of the Lord. All right, we've got introductions behind us. Let's jump right into the text. Proverbs 1, 7. Thanks, Uli, for reading that. We're going to be talking this morning about the fear of the Lord. We've already mentioned this a little bit if you've been with us in the, in the last uh, few weeks when we started our, our study of Proverbs. We mentioned that this was coming to talk about the fear of the Lord and, and all the confusion that comes along with the concept of fear. Are we supposed to feel fear? Are we not supposed to feel fear? What are we supposed to do when it comes to fear? Uh, and what exactly is the fear of the Lord? And why does it lead to knowledge? That's an interesting thing that we're, 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 we're picking up in our, in our verse right here. So there's a lot of questions that come with this concept of fear. So I wanted to just take a, a, a Sunday morning and, and just kind of lay it out for us, do it together. Um, fear in the book of Proverbs and, and what exactly is it and what are we called to do and how do we apply this? How do we, how do we actually fear the Lord properly? So with that said, let's, let's go into prayer, and then uh, we'll jump into the text. God, we ask that you this morning would give us a clearer understanding of what it means that you are our Father. Be, we know, those of us that are Christians, those of us that have put our trust in Christ, we know that by being in Christ, we have come into your family. That we, like Jesus, can call you Father. But what does that mean in practice, Lord? Help us through your word to understand what it means for the seven days a week that I live my life, that you are my father. And help me, Lord, understand, help us understand what it means that we are to fear you in that context. Fear you as a father. God, we need your Holy Spirit. This is a difficult concept. It's a concept that for many of us, the word fear just brings in all kinds of, 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 of connotations and past feelings, Lord. What we need is your word. We need to be strengthened by the truth of your word. So I pray you would come, Holy Spirit, apply this text now to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we've talked about this difficulty already. It's difficult to hear, especially in the 21st century, it is difficult to hear the concept of fear. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of written today. There's a lot on social media. There's a lot about overcoming your fears, right? And when we get that idea that there are things that are scary that are out there, but we need to overcome those fears. We need to live our lives boldly, you know, and out loud and, and, be, and, be, and be courageous when it comes to fear. And so we get the verses in the Bible usually that are talking about where Jesus has removed our fear, right? In fact, uh, in, in Christianity, we, we write a lot of songs about how Jesus removes fear, right? We have a lot of that. I, I think of some of the songs that have come out in the last 10 years. A lot of them are about fear and about overcoming fear. And so we, we, we get one side of this coin, if you will. But what we have a hard time with, if you're like me, is we, we have a hard time with the verses that say, you better fear the Lord. You better fear him. Whoa, is that the kind of relationship I am supposed to have with my God, that I am supposed to fear him? And what does that mean exactly? And is there a way to take that too far? And so how do we get to the biblical center of what fear actually is. And, and just to show you that, that both are there in the Bible, look at 1 John 4.18. Let's just start by looking at a couple of verses this morning. Look at 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Okay? So 1 John 4.18, if I read Jesus, and because perfect love casts out fear. 
right? Jesus' perfect love casts out fear. I'm not supposed to feel fear. But then there's this, 1 Peter 1, 17. Peter says this, And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Okay, so if the next day I read this verse, now what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to cast fear out because perfect love has cast it out. Jesus has come. I'm not supposed to be fearful. And here's Peter telling me, you better conduct yourselves with fear. So what's going on here? Is the Bible confused? Is God confused as he wrote the Bible? Or are we dealing with subtleties here? Are we dealing with things that are in tension that we have to do more study to figure out that there's actually two things maybe being discussed here? I have a feeling you guys know which one I'm going to go with here. <laughs> so what makes one kind of fear wrong and the other kind of fear correct? Here, here's some general thoughts, okay? I'm just going to give some general thoughts, and then I want to actually jump into the text, and we're going to see some more things about fear. The wrong kind of fear, the bad fear, seems to forget the gospel of Jesus Christ and sees God as a, and, and forgets, or, and sees God as a punisher of all people. Let me say that again. The wrong kind of fear seems to forget the gospel, and sees God as a punisher of all people, no matter what, okay? So there is a way to fear God outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a way to fear God even, even as a, even though you may be a believer, you may have put your trust in him, but you're not thinking in that moment, out, you're, you're thinking in that moment outside of the gospel. In other words, you're pretending for a moment, Christian, that you are standing outside of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ that comes for every Christian. And you're thinking, okay, I'm afraid of God. I am afraid. And the Bible would say, that's not a good fear. That's not the fear that you are called to have. Notice Revelation 117. Here's John, the author of Revelation. And it says, when I saw him, this is Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. But... He laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. Okay, so what's happening here in Revelation? John has had, he's had a revelation. He's had, he's had a, a picture of Jesus. He's been caught up into the presence of Jesus. He's experiencing what it's like to be in Jesus' presence. And what does he do? He falls on his face as a dead man, it says. Absolute terror befalls John, who's a Christian. Terror has befallen him. And listen to what Jesus, look at what Jesus does. He laid his right hand on me. This is a powerful picture here in scripture. He laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. Don't fear, John. Don't fear. It's okay. Yes, you are in the presence of the God of the universe, but it's okay. Why is it okay? This is such an important question. If you're approaching the Bible, maybe you are here and you're a skeptic this morning. Why is it okay for John? Is it okay for everybody to be in the very presence of God? No, it's not okay for everybody to be in the very presence of God. You would be incinerated to be in the very presence of God like John is right here. Why is it okay for John? It's okay for John because John is a Christian. It's okay for John because John has put his trust in Jesus Christ and his sins that would have incinerated him have been done away with forever. And so Jesus can, with John, put his right hand on John and say, John, fear not. 
Christian, if that's the kind of fear we're talking about this morning, that fear is gone for you. By contrast, though, there is a right kind of fear. And here's a couple of thoughts on the right kind of fear. The right kind of fear seems to be created by the gospel. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the right kind of fear means believing that God's word is true and that God is really capable of doing what God says he's capable of doing. Okay. There is a kind of fear that we experience when we know even a person, even a human being is very, very capable at what they're doing. Some of you have played sports in your lives. Okay. There's a certain kind of fear a, a good fear that comes upon that comes across you when you as your team have to play against a team with a really, really good player on that team. Think about this for a minute. Think back to your high school days. Maybe some of you played college sports, whatever it was. You all sat together and you had a meeting in your, on, amongst your team. And what did you talk about when you had your meeting? You talked about that player on that other team. And you talked about that player's capabilities. And you said, hey, we got to double team this guy. This, this girl over here, we got to get two on her because we better properly fear her. We better properly respond to the capabilities that this particular athlete has on the other team because if we don't, guess what? We're going to lose the game. So double team. Okay. Now, that's a silly human example. We're talking about the God of the universe here. But here's the connection. Here's the connection. When you fear God, you know his capabilities. And you don't try to double team him. That's not the point. When you know God's capabilities, you know him in his capabilities as a judge. You know him in his holiness. You know him in the power that he has over our very lives. And what do you do when you experience the truth of that? When it hits you, what's the Bible call that when it hits your heart and you go, that's true about God, that's called fear. I know what is true about God. And oftentimes it's associated with God's judgment. I know that when God says he is coming to judge the living and the dead, I know that that is true. The opposite of this kind of fear is flippancy, triviality, meh, that kind of concept. Not that big of a deal, right? That other player on the other team, all state, all CIF, not that big of a deal. We don't need a double team, right? God of the universe claims to be an almighty judge. Not going to come for me. You know, one of the con things that has always been leveled against Christians from for 2000 years. In fact, it's, it's leveled against Christians so much that Peter himself actually talks about it. It's this concept that the world will always look at Christians and say, you Christians keep talking about Jesus coming back. You keep saying it. And it's been 2000 years. And he hasn't come. You keep, you know, and then there's silly Christians. Sorry, there's, and some of them really are Christians, but they're just silly. And then they start making predictions about days, you know, like he's going to come on this day. And even though the Bible tells us, you do not know the day, they think, they think they know the day. And then, and then the world is like, stand back, like, uh huh, uh huh, okay. And then the day comes and they're like, yeah, that's pretty much what we've been telling you the whole time. So this is one of the most common common attacks leveled against Christianity is you all keep saying he's coming to judge the world and he hasn't come. And what does Peter say? He says, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't think 
that the Lord is somehow slack, which is a word like that kind of means like lazy concerning his coming. He's coming. Okay. And so, and Christians, this is an article of faith. This is something we believe and we believe it so wholeheartedly that we live our lives out of that constant thinking that Jesus is returning. It's a constant for us. Right. And yet the world looks at it and says, meh, come on. You really think that? That is not fearing God. But if you're a Christian, you are called by God's word to fear him, fear his capabilities. And then you know what a Christian does daily? When we fear him, we run to the only one that is the actual asbestos armor from the fire of God, right? We run to Christ because we fear God. So the gospel creates this fear in us, but then the gospel is the destination we run to when we feel that proper fear of God and we flee to Christ only out of fear, friends. It's only out of fear that you're going to run to Jesus. When we go out and we share the gospel with people, the, I will tell you the biggest reason why people don't respond to the gospel. The biggest reason they don't respond to the gospel is because they have no fear of what the consequences are. Now, listen to, I didn't say that it's only the consequences that, that make people a Christian. Okay. You don't scare people into heaven. However, it is very, very much a part of this overall understanding of truth that you're trying to bring to them in the gospel that God really is a judge. And he really, they really, there's really a problem here of them standing before him in their sin. And if they don't understand that, they'll never come. Jesus is, what's he for? If I don't have sin or if God isn't going to judge me. So what does it mean for us then? And this is the main point I want to get to. What does it mean for us to fear the Lord? Here's what I think it means for us to fear the Lord properly. The fear of the Lord means hearing his word with the seriousness required for obedience. Hearing his word with the seriousness required for obedience. Someone who fears the Lord comes to God's word. The only way we know God is through this book. It comes to God's word with an intentionality and a seriousness, which says your words are true. I want to obey them. I need to obey them. I can't just read this and flippantly get up and go deal with the rest of my day. I got to listen to what your word is saying when I read. And so this becomes church, echo church. This becomes something that is absolute utmost important for us together as a church to learn how to fear the Lord. Because it means the difference between a church that just talks a lot, right? A preacher that just talks a lot, Christians that just talk a lot about Christian spiritual things and then don't obey, that's, that's a church that's not fearing. But a church that is fearing is a church that says, we take God's word seriously, so seriously that I walk away going, how can I obey this? I can't be flippant about his word. So there's a proper fear we're supposed to have. We see it in Proverbs 1.7. Now we finally got to our text. Proverbs 1.7, here we go. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, so we kind of established what fear is, okay? I'm gonna keep working with the definition of fear, but now I wanna move on. I wanna talk about a few other things because there's a real, some real confusing stuff in this particular passage, okay? For instance, what we see here in the text is that knowledge about anything is connected to the fear of the Lord. Anybody find that strange? Okay, maybe it's just knowledge of God. Well, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that it's just, just about theology. It says knowledge, period. It's the beginning of all knowledge. But that's weird because we got a lot of smart people that don't fear God, right? We got a lot of people with a lot of knowledge that do not fear God. 
Let's look at a few other verses that say something really similar in the book of Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 129, just a few verses down. It says, this is about people that don't know the Lord. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Okay, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So it's talking about a particular people and it's giving a reason and parallel. They didn't fear the Lord. So again, we see knowledge and the fear of the Lord are connected right there. How about Proverbs 2, 4 through 5? This is about knowledge. This is about wisdom now. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Okay. Again, knowledge is connected to the fear of the Lord. Here's point number one. If you guys are taking notes, fear is a requirement for seeing the world the way God sees it. Fear is a requirement for seeing the world the way God sees it. Now let's go to the most interesting verse when it comes to knowledge and understanding and having to do with, with, with fear and loving God. Listen to what David says in Psalm 119, 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. What is David saying right there? Yeah, I know more than everybody that, that's taught me in school. I know more than all of them. Why do I know more than all of them? Because I have meditated on your word. That's what that means there. Medita my tes your testimonies are my meditation. I've meditated on your word. I know your Bible. I know what your word is. So I know more than all my teachers. Uh, really? David, so does that mean that I can walk up if Albert Einstein was still alive today, I could go up to Albert Einstein and say, Albert Einstein, I know more about the universe than you do because I've read my Bible. We're like, mm, is that right? Like, do I know astrophysics because I know my Bible? Do I know quantum mechanics because I know my Bible? What does this mean? Is it true? Or is David just saying stuff that's not true? Now think about how this verse is just connected to what we just saw. In Proverbs, we were told that the very first thing that knowledge requires is the fear of God. And here we're told that meditating on the word of God, that's his testimonies, that's what's being said there, gives David more understanding than all his teachers. Okay, so those verses are connected. You wanna know knowledge? You wanna know things? You wanna know more than all your teachers? Proverbs says the fear of God is the beginning of that. And David says, meditating on your word is how I get there. Okay. Fear of God, meditating on God's word. Those concepts are being connected here. So here's point number two. If you're taking notes, fearing God has to do with meditating on his word. Okay. Meditating, putting our minds fully on him, believing what his word really has to say. Now let's get to this question. Is it true that David has more knowledge than his teachers? I want to take just a quick second to talk about science and what science is for a minute, okay? Let's define science together. I'm going to define it in a very general way. Science is the collection of human knowledge about a particular topic, and it's also the method of collecting that knowledge. Okay, so you could say by all means living, right? And so you could say, well, biology is the collection of human knowledge about all living things. Okay, you could also say biology is the methods of how we collect information about living things. So it's the experiments that are done. And it's also the results of those experiments so that we now learn more as human beings as to what biology is, as to what living things are, right? And so it's a collection of knowledge and it's also a method for collecting knowledge. But there's a limit to science. There is a really important limit to science. And there's, there's many, but here's one of them. Science is able to answer questions about the what of the world. 
it is not able to answer questions about the why of the world. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. Science is able to answer the what of the world, not the why of the world. Science does not try to find the purpose of things. Why does the world exist? Why do you exist as an individual human being? Why? Science says, we're not even, we're not even trying to find that. That's not, our, that's not our goal. I mean, we can tell you about maybe how the atoms in your body came to be. We can maybe tell you how the earth was created. We could tell you that roughly 4.3 billion years ago, there was a protoplanetary disk around the sun, right? And, and, that it, and that it eventually coalesced in this thing called earth and that you've got a bunch of elements in it that are eventually from a previous supernova that exploded billions of years before that, right? And so it can go back and back and back and all the way to this thing called the Big Bang and then it stops, Right? Because, well, why the Big Bang? And science just says, we're, we're, that's not our job. That's not what we're here to do. Like, like, Christian, do you understand? There's nothing wrong with science. Don't ever think that you need to pit somehow your faith against science. Science, when it's done in its purest form, is simply just seeking answers for, for the, the, the world that's been created around us. But it cannot tell you why the world was created. It cannot tell you what that supernova was supposed to do, what it was for. It cannot tell you what the earth is for, what the sun is for, or what you are for. It's never attempted to do that. And if a scientist tries to tell you that they are trying to do that, they are a liar. That's not science. Now they've decided to step into other realms of thought that are outside of science. And frankly, there's a number of them that just need to stay in their lane. Your job is not to tell us why. Your job is to tell us what and causes and laws that govern our universe. Okay, so we've got all this science and it can't tell us why. And then we've got Psalm 19.1, you ready for this? Why? The heavens, everything that's been made, everything, declare the glory of God. We just answered a question, why? Why have all of the heavens, all billions of galaxies, which each containing about 10 billion stars on average each, why were they all created? And the nebula and the black holes and all of the things that exist out there, why were they created? They declare the glory of God. Amen. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And if you go to other verses, which I won't do, you will find out that everything in all creation, the purpose of it is to declare the glory of God, including you, including you, whether you're a Christian, or not your job, your purpose in life. The reason for your existence is to glorify the God that made you. So science can't tell us that, but I can read one verse in the Bible. You know what I just added? You know what I just figured out that science couldn't tell me? I just figured out the purpose for everything. So I may not know a lot about subatomic particles, but I know why they were created. Did you get that? Like it's not going to get me a PhD, but it gives me a framework and an understanding for the universe that I, that I actually can build upon with real science. I can build upon with an, a knowledge of how astrophysics works and astronomy and what's going on out there in the world. But you know what it does? You know what it's doing now when I build that knowledge on top of it? It's just increasing for me the way that is glorifying God. So the more I learn about a subject now, okay, high school students in this room who maybe you don't want to study and, and school is boring to you, get this, get this for a second because I didn't get it till way later in life. Your increasing of knowledge is worship if you're increasing it and seeing everything as glorifying God. You got some math that you got to do that's boring. Guess what? God created that. 
God created the logic of math. He created everything around us. So every Christian, if we were properly worshiping, we would just say, man, I just want to learn everything there is to know because I can just, it just increases my love and my knowledge of God and who he is and my, my worship of him. We don't fear science. Science is what a Christian uses to worship. Oh, but an atheistic scientist is not doing that, are they? They have a totally different framework. And they have an incorrect framework. They might know way more than you. They got a totally incorrect framework. And I'm not smiling and laughing as if in some flippant way. I'm just saying there's so much thrown against Christianity by science, but Christians just understand science is just understanding how God made the world and just glorifies him. What did I have to do to gain that knowledge about Proverbs 19.1? What did I have to do? The heavens declare the glory of God. I now know why everything exists. What did I have to do in order to know now why everything exists? I had to read Proverbs 9, or, sorry, Psalm 19, 1, and I had to believe it. Right. I had to read it, and I had to believe it. And in that belief is fear. I know that that sounds weird. But in that believing what I'm reading is fear. Because what did I say fear was? God is actually capable of doing what he says he's doing. God is actually capable. God is actually true. When he says it, he means it. And we should fear that. So here's point number three, if you're taking notes. Fear is a form of faith that believes God's words are true and that he is serious about them. That's fear. When I read Proverbs 19.1 and I say, that's true, that's true. I'm believing that. I'm taking that into my heart now. I'm fearing God. Fearing God means reading his word and believing it so intently, intensely that it changes your life. It recognizes that his word is true and that ultimately leads to fruit. It leads to obedience in a Christian's life. Proverbs 3.7, what does it say? Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So notice that last line there. There, by fearing the Lord, fearing the Lord is the means in which I use to turn away from evil. Fear leads to obedience, which is another way of turning away from evil. Fear leads to obedience elsewhere in the Bible, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, we are told that fear is part of the process of obedience. Watch this. Deuteronomy 13, 11. And all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. Notice the, I want you to notice the three aspects of what God says right there. Hear, fear, and obey. In this case, the obey isn't the words obey. It's like, don't do the bad thing that I was telling you not to do, right? But that's obedience. So I want you to notice, hear, fear, and obey. Hear it again, Deuteronomy 17, 13. And all the people, God says, shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. Hear, fear, and obey. How about Deuteronomy 31, 12? Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of his law. Hear, fear, and obey. So this, this sort of equation, if you will, is working all the way through the Bible, and it is this concept that it's, it's we hear... And we respond seriously to what we hear. And that leads to obedience. It leads to a life where we are taking God seriously. We're taking God at his word. Now, here's the point. If you're taking notes, fear is a necessary ingredient for doing the Lord's will. Okay. Necessary ingredient for doing the Lord's will. Now, let's apply this. In just the last few minutes, let's apply this together. If you find that you are having difficulty obeying God, there's a, little, 
there's a diagnostic check that you can run. You know, like when I have a problem with my car, right? And I might take it over to Adam, right? And I'm going to say, Adam, I got a problem with my car. It's making a clanking noise. I'm not sure what's going on. And Adam would probably, I'm guessing, plug that car into some kind of computer and the computer is just going to run a bunch of checks. Is this okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? And then you hope, right, that it's going to come across some problem and that the problem's cheap, right? So <laughs> there's a diagnostic check as a Christian that you run when you're feeling like I'm not obeying God. There's something in my heart that's not obeying him. I'm a Christian. I'm believing, but I'm not obeying him. Okay, here's the diagnostic check. Hear, fear, obey. All right, let's start with here. Are you hearing God's word? <clears throat> the first check of a Christian of hear, fear, and obey is are you hearing God's word? And I want to say with no intent to shame you, Christian, at all, that you have to be reading the word regularly to continue in the obedience of the Lord. Okay. With no shame. Okay. The past is the past. I'm not looking at anybody. And if, if you think right now that it's been, oh my gosh, since I've read the Bible. Okay. Here's what's amazing about the gospel, right? All the past is gone and we start fresh. The mercies of God are new every morning, but let me say it clearly. You have to be reading the Bible continuously, like daily, like it's your meal that you take in, in order to be obedient to the Lord. And the first diagnostic check you run is, am I even hearing God? Am I even reading scripture, which is the way in which I hear God? That's the first check you run. Reading the Bible is like when the Israelites were gathering the manna in the wilderness. You guys remember this story, some of you, right? They had to go out every day. It wasn't like, I'm going to store a bunch up and keep it in my house and I'm good. They had to go out every day to eat. Christian, the Bible actually teaches us that the word of God is like bread, we have to actually go through the process of eating it every day. Otherwise we start feeling really hungry and eventually you die, right? They gathered it every day. They could only gather enough for that day, right? Otherwise it would spoil. You don't store up Bible reading. You get into God's word daily. It's meant to be your daily bread as a Christian, so first diagnostic check, are you hearing God's word? Are you reading it? Are you actually in it? Hey, here's a great thing to do. Get together with another member or with a member of this church and say, hey, I'm struggling with my Bible reading. Could we read the Bible together? Could we get together regularly and read the Bible? I need some help from a brother or a sister who's doing this to just kind of get me going. Right? We do it with working out, don't we? If you haven't worked out in a long time, you usually grab somebody and you're like, hey, would you go with me? I really need help. I'm... I'm really just out of, out of discipline with this. A lot of you do that. We should do this with our Bible reading, but we don't because we're shamed. We feel like we're shamed in, in, because, because we haven't done it in a long time. And so we go, I don't want anybody to know that. I want to look like I'm better than I am. But, but you're just going to stay that way. Christian, find help if you're not reading your Bible regularly. Find help. That's why we're together as a church. It's one of the major reasons why we are together as a church is to do this. Number two, if you're reading, okay, if that check is passed, the question is now fear. Are you fearing what you're reading? Now, remember the definition of fear. I'm taking God seriously when God says this about himself or when he says to do that. I'm taking him seriously. Remember the Bible is commanding us to hear and fear. And remember, we've been connecting fear to faith all morning. Fear is connected to faith. I believe what God is saying when he tells me to do this or that. It means believing what you hear. And that means it is possible to do the physical exercise of reading without actually taking anything in and actually taking seriously what you're reading. And friends, I'm a pastor. I've done that all the time. I do that a lot going through the motions. Got to read my Bible. I'm a pastor, right? 
This is what I do. And to come away from that feeling like I didn't fear. I didn't, I didn't take seriously what I had read. I didn't meditate on God's word. I flippantly went over it. And a person that does not fear when they hear what they hear is typically making sin a light thing. Sin's not just not that big of a deal. They don't really care about certain sins in their life. Oh, please hear me for just a second, friends. Oh, the big sins, like don't murder, don't commit adultery. Oh, they've got that down, okay? Uh, I don't do big sins, okay? It's the little sins. I'm putting that in quotes if you're hearing, just hearing my voice. It's the little sins. It's whatever they consider to be small sins that they typically ignore. God says, don't be drunk with wine, Not a big deal. Not a, does he, come on. Did it really affect me? Did I do anything terrible? Not a big deal, right? God says, have no hint of sexual immorality among you. Dating couples. Oh, come on. Not that big of a deal. God says, pay to Caesar what is Caesar's. I'll just fudge on this number right here. And the biggest problem is that you hear the word and you develop this habit of hearing the word and you don't fear the God of the word. You think that he just sort of lets people off on whatever sin it is that you want to do. I'm indicting myself in this, friends. You, whatever you want to do, oh, he, that's not that big of a deal. You develop now a way of thinking where you approach scripture and you think it's optional. That's not fear. James 4.8 has words for us on this. This is harsh. James 4.8, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now, is he saying that? to every single Christian on the planet? Is, it, is, that, is that direct application for every single Christian on the planet? No, it's direct application for those who are reading without fear. For those who are saying, mm, it's not that big of a deal. I'm just gonna go on with my laughter and my joyful life, no matter what, not realizing that I'm just sinning against my God and I don't care about it. And James says, get that smile off your face because you're not fearing. You're not reading, you're not taking God's word seriously. And I wanna say something important at this point. There are some Christians who do not fear God enough. Like, like that, that's a thing amongst all of us. And there are some Christians who have such a sensitive conscience that they are always on the lookout for the slightest offense to God and they are anxiety ridden. Like that's a thing too. Right? So depending on who you are right now, how you heard me right now, you're either like crushed, right? You're crushed inside. Or you needed to hear that. And the point of the God's word right there was not to crush the anxiety ridden. Okay. There's other things you need to work on. Okay. And, and part of it is just recognizing the gospel and the truth of the gospel and how it actually works out in your life. That's to those who see sin everywhere in their hearts. But some of you just don't see sin at all. Or some of you see sin so, so rarely that there's, there's just a flippancy with which you live life. And, and James is speaking to you right now, friend. But here's what's awesome about the gospel. The gospel's for both of you. The gospel is for the introspective, heart-searching sinner that sees sin everywhere. You don't have to convince them of their sin. They know that they have sin, and yet they are seriously questioning whether a God could look upon their sin and actually ever love them enough to do anything for them. And if that's you, the gospel is for you this morning. The gospel is shocking to us. 
that it is that Jesus would, would do for us what he did upon the cross, but you need to believe it. You need to work on your faith and you need to decide, I'm going to believe that. I'm going to believe it in the way I actually live my life. And listen now, listen, for those of you that are flippant about sin, okay, I have a couple things to say to you. Number one, the gospel tells us that sin is so serious that the God of the universe came upon the cross and died the most humiliating and excruciating death possible to take care of sin. That's what it takes to take care of sin. Death. The judgment of God falling upon Jesus on the cross. And you don't just accept that and then go on just living however you want to live. You don't have a flippant attitude towards sin if you actually understand what the gospel says about what sin is and how it had to be dealt with. So the gospel's for you, friend, and specifically what we call the bad news of the gospel, that outside of Christ, we are incinerated by the holiness of God. The gospel's for both. Friends, let us hear God's word with fear. Let us have the gospel have such a tremendous impact on our hearts that we understand both the depths of sin and how serious sin is in our lives. And then because of that, the incredible gift of mercy that we were given when Jesus took our sin and it was, it was upon his shoulders. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. We sang it today. My sin weighed upon your shoulders is on his shoulders on the cross and it's gone from you. And let's have such a, such an understanding of the gospel that it leads us neither to navel gazing and introspection nor to flippant living where we just live however we want without a care in the world. Let's be constrained by the gospel and it's the fear of the Lord, which recognizes that God is serious when he speaks about sin, when he speaks about obedience and what we're called to do. And it's because of Christ that we're enabled to be able to walk in that fear. Let's pray together. Lord, we love, we love your word because it checks us on all sides. I know that we're on all different parts of that spectrum that I just talked about. Those who are have regular anxiety and fear over their sin and those who walk more flippantly. God, wherever we are, you have mercy for us and you you speak in some ways, you speak the same. You point us to your son, Jesus on the cross and you point us there to see what we need to see. So God, may we look and may we see with clarity, open our eyes, Holy Spirit to be able to consider ourselves and how we fit into this particular teaching of your word. What do we need to do? What are you enabling us and empowering us to do this morning? We pray this in your name.